Okay, uh, I, I think uh, we'll start now. Um, so good morning and uh, good afternoon, uh, everybody. Uh, so welcome to the first webinar uh, conducted, uh, organized by the Drugs for Neglected Diseases Initiative uh, on dengue. And uh, uh, DNDI has included dengue under its portfolio uh, since 2021 December. Uh, given it's important and given that it's a neglected tropical infection uh, which causes significant morbidity and mortality in uh, dengue endemic countries which is mostly uh, lower middle income countries and low income countries uh, and today we have a very exciting line of speakers uh, and i don't think i need to tell this audience the importance of dengue and uh, in 2019 uh, 2019 uh, uh, the WHO named dengue as one of the top uh, 10 global threats uh, to, to global health. And uh, with climate change, of course, the incidence of dengue has increased. And you see that dengue is now present in many other locations that it was not present before. And even in countries like Nepal, uh, we see massive epidemics there as Nepal and, and uh, Myanmar were free of dengue for a long time. Uh, and even in the countries which had experienced dengue for a long time, the demographics have changed. Uh, so you see different uh, disease patterns, uh, dengue in pregnancy, and especially uh, clinicians working in tertiary care hospitals see many complications associated with dengue. Uh, so uh, although uh, we were going to start with uh, Professor Hiva Harris, uh, there has been a little bit of miscommunication regarding the timing of the webinar. Uh, so uh, we are trying to contact her to uh, uh, get her to join uh, because uh, I believe uh, it's 2.30 a.m. Uh, in Pacific time uh, where she currently lives. Uh, so uh, we are trying to uh, somehow contact her and uh, see if she can join. But we will start with uh, Dr. Rakesh Loda. And I don't think uh, we need an introduction to Dr. Rakesh Loda. He's a well a uh, world-renowned pediatrician from Ames, New Delhi. Uh, he's in the Division of Pediatric Pulmonology and Intensive Care and in charge of Pediatric Intensive Care Services. And his research interests are uh, Pediatric Intensive Care, Respiratory Disease and Infectious Diseases, including Dengue. And he has multiple research grants and has published more than 500 articles in peer-reviewed journals, authored multiple book chapter, chapters and published a few books. Uh, so I don't think I would go on uh, on and on about uh, Dr. Loda uh, because he has a very exciting uh, presentation uh, on, on the complications of dengue in ch uh, children, what he's been experiencing and, and treating at AIMS in dengue. So over to you, uh, Dr. Rakesh Loda. Oh, thank you, Dr. Nilika, for your kind words. And uh, thanks to DNDI for this opportunity to talk about uh, dengue and infection or tertiary care perspective. So I'll just share my screen and uh, let me know if it's uh, visible. Yes, we can see uh, see the screen. Okay, great. So uh, yeah, thank you again. So I think over next 20-25 uh, minutes, I'll just try and cover briefly about the spectrum of dengue and what we actually see in a tertiary care setup. Uh, and off late, I think there's been a lot of focus on the unusual manifestations and a bit about the management uh, strategies. So as Dr. Nilika has highlighted, dengue is an important public health pro problem uh, and it has a wide clinical spectrum. Uh, unfortunately, if we see over a period of time means there seems to be expansion of the footprint of dengue with areas which were previously not covered, also been covered. Uh, the estimates are uh, a few years back uh, were nearly 400 million dengue infections every year, and of which about 25% uh, would manifest uh, clinically with any severity of illness. Uh, thankfully, with uh, protocolized management, the case fatality rates are extremely low now for 1%. Uh, however, when you get focal outbreaks away from urban areas in the country, uh, the mortality may actually be higher from 3 to 5%, but this is overall mortality. Uh, we all know that you know there are uh, four strains, uh, one to four. Uh, the fifth one has been thought to be there, but I think there's no definitive agreement on this. Uh, some bit of uh, association of certain strains with severe manifestations, particularly dengue two and uh, dengue three. Uh, dengue one alone has uh, uh, milder symptoms, uh, high prevalence of musculoskeletal and GI manifestations with dengue three. 
and dengue for higher prevalence of respiratory and cutaneous uh, manifestation. Now, uh, this, the typing of the strains is not done routinely while we are managing clinically, but for data would come from the uh, surveillance uh, activities that, that are going on. And importantly, I think it's also uh, the infections occurring in a sequence. If dengue 2 is following a previous year with a milder strain like dengue 1 and all, there may be a higher likelihood of complicated uh, dengue. Now, quickly, uh, I think we all are aware about the severe dengue, uh, which is uh, there in terms of uh, uh, the classification, the 2009 classification, dengue with or without warning signs. And uh, then we have the severe dengue, which would have char is characterized by shock, fluid accumulation, severe bleeding, or severe organ uh, dysfunction. And the definitions, if we try and look at the uh, milder variants, that is dengue without any warning signs, and with warning signs, uh, the spectrum or the, the distribution would vary as to where we are actually looking for this classification. So out in the place at a primary health center, a majority would still be dengue without any warning signs. And as we move towards the tertiary care, we are going to see an increasing proportion of uh, severe dengue. So this particular study from uh, Bengaluru, uh, nearly 600 children, uh, about 12% uh, had dengue without warning signs, 50% uh, had dengue with warning signs, and about 34% was severe dengue. And this is how it shows across the age groups. So overall, we can see all across the age groups, uh, the uh, in, at least in, in this kind of study, dengue with warning sign is the dominant one. Uh, there seems to be a greater proportion of uh, severe dengue as we kind of see increase in the age, but I think uh, those data are still variable. At our uh, institute, approximately 40 to 55 percent of all dengue that is uh, that we look after is actually severe dengue. But then this is basically because uh, data from hospitals and particularly tertiary care hospitals is going to be skewed towards uh, severe disease. Now, the other important group is infants, and uh, this is particularly important because uh, many times, uh, uh, let's say, the, the major hypothesis is about uh, uh, a second infection causing more severe disease, and infants uh, would not have been exposed except that they may have some maternal antibodies circulating in their blood against dengue, and therefore antibody-enhanced infections and all may be a possibility. So I'm just sharing one of the series from Belor in South India, uh, where uh, uh, amongst the children, nearly 400 children who are hospitalized with dengue, about 25% uh, were infants. And of these infants, 53% had severe dengue, 40% uh, actually presented with shock. And of these children who presented with shock, 92% uh, required vasoactive drugs. So something over and above fluids were required in these children. Uh, multiple organ dysfunction was seen in 14%, and overall mortality was 13%. And the main causes of death were progressive multiple organ dysfunction and acute pulmonary hemorrhage. So just highlights that what the severity could be, uh, while majority of the cases may be managed with fluid therapy alone, which is titrated to clinical condition as well as the hematocrit values, uh, there would be a subset which has more severe disease and needs more than uh, the IV fluids and monitoring. Similarly, other category that we would look at is immunocompromised children in a tertiary care setting where for various reasons you would have immunocompromised children, including those who have malignancies, a uh, number of conditions where steroids are indicated. And here we face diagnostic problems related to neutropenia. Whether these are due to chemotherapy or other opportunistic infections are there and therefore there's a need for high index of suspicion. Uh, in a small series that we reported, uh, these kids had more severe illness, uh, had a high requirement of fluid. Uh, hepatic dysfunction was seen more often, and there was delayed recovery of platelet counts, particularly in those who had uh, malignancies treated with cancer chemotherapy drugs. Now, other important thing is you know, in, in a tropical uh, country setup, you would have other uh, differential diagnosis. So they could be varied things that we would look at, like fever, PTK, capillary fragility or they may be thrombocytopenia and shock, or they may be fever with organ hem hemorrhage or organ dysfunction and coagulation failure, which may be there. And there could be multiple conditions that we may have to think about, including meningococcemia, picket cell infections seem to be on a rise across the country. Uh, then there could be other combinations, uh, particularly uh, looking at malaria, uh, 
uh, non-infective conditions like anoxone and purpurinol, which we need, need to keep in mind. Similarly, in a setting where there would be uh, thrombocytopenia, fever, shock, uh, in our setup, we do need to look at overwhelming sepsis, which may be typically be gram-negative sepsis, salmonellosis, malaria, there could be chikungunya and some other hemorrhagic fever, which we need to keep, uh, uh, which we need to consider. And then once we talk about organ dysfunctions right at the beginning, then we need to be also be looking at septicemia, leptospirosis, uh, uh, hemolytic uremic syndrome, and again, DIC due to varied causes. So the challenge is to uh, kind of keep these conditions in mind and investigate uh, along while we investigate for dengue as well. Uh, quickly, I wouldn't spend too much time on this because uh, this is pretty much standard in terms of the management uh, we currently do not have any any specific anti-dengue drugs, so the management essentially is supportive. And uh, in ambulatory care, essentially it's about oral hydration and controlling fever with paracetamol while we avoid the uh, NSAIDs. Uh, I think it's important that uh, children, because it's a pretty dynamic uh, kind of a condition, a child who presents today doesn't have any warning signs, needs to be monitored for development of any of the warning signs and accordingly hospitalization would be required. And uh, we need to also be aware about the referral criteria. So wherever there are any signs of shock coming in, like cold extremities, restlessness, confusion, extreme lethargy, uh, warning signs like abdominal pain, frequent vomiting, urine output starting to get reduced, or any bleeding manifestations, and on monitoring if you're finding a rising PCV or thrombocytopenia, even without clinical symptoms, I think this, this, these children need uh, evaluation and hospitalization. So apart from those mild ones, those with warning signs or features of severe dengue would need hospitalization. Uh, as I said, uh, IV fluids are the key. Uh, we need to uh, make sure that, you know, uh, adequate fluids are given. A child who's able to take orally should be encouraged to take adequate fluids orally and limit the IV fluids. However, in the critical phase, the IV fluids may be required for about 24 to 48 hours. And during the recovery phase, uh, the IV fluid should be stopped because here we run in uh, risk of actually getting into a fluid overload state. Uh, whatever fluid is extravasated would actually start getting into the vasculature and here we risk a uh, child getting into congestive heart failure. Uh, the mainstay of management still are uh, isotonic crystalloid solution, the multiple trials which have documented that these work fine and therefore there's no need for using colloids at the outset. And uh, uh, one may consider colloids only if there is profound hypotensive shock or after uh, 20 to 30 ml per kg of crystalloids, if still the perfusion remains poor, one may consider it. Similarly, high hematocrit persisting even after crystalloid administration in a state of shock, one may consider this. Now, this is not really you know, backed up by data or comparative studies within this subgroup, but uh, this is what most units would be practicing. The key focus being on crystalloids and avoiding colloids and only in a few subsets one may use colloids. Uh, the fluids, again, I think uh, uh, we all tend to use the WHO protocol. Uh, those with warning signs, uh, not in shock, starting at a certain rate of five to seven ml per kg per run, then gradually reducing it and then trying to stop it over 24 to 48 hours. Uh, continue with paracetamol for fever, adequate monitoring. I think that's something that is critical. And also monitoring the uh, hematocrit or pack cell volume. Uh, if we can do it by simply spinning a capillary, uh, that's uh, good enough. Now, quickly touching upon the management of severe dengue. So uh, in, in, a, in a setting where there is compensated uh, shock, uh, in that setting, one does start with IV fluids uh, at a higher rate. And depending on the clinical improvement and hematocrit, we modify our infusion rates, trying to uh, kind of uh, reduce the infusion rate. On the other hand, if there is no improvement, then there would be a setting of uh, where we may consider blood transfusion when they, we are suspecting a bleed and there is fallen hematocrit. Or if this is still not helping, then uh, in, in, in a subset, we would need to use vasoactive drugs along with uh, maintenance fluid. Uh, those who present with hypotensive shock, uh, one would have to give rapid fluid boluses, something similar to what we do for septic shock. And then rest of the management protocol is similar as to what we just discussed for the compensated uh, shock. The concerns obviously are fluid overload because uh, initially children may need uh, very high fluid rates for few hours. And even if we are giving, let's say, 7 ml per kg uh, per hour, 
uh, we are likely to touch upon uh, get to so called that maintenance fluid within a few hours and the uh, child definitely would be receiving much more than that and at the same time there is capillary leak so the fluid would be accumulating in the interstitial space it would be accumulating in the pleural space and therefore uh, one has to be wary uh, that these don't interfere with uh, the breathing so if there is so massive pleural effusion, then the child could actually get into respiratory distress related to that. And one has to manage these children carefully, uh, trying to avoid the temptation to pull out the fluid from the pleural space, because in the initial leaky part, uh, these would tend to reaccumulate and also one runs, runs uh, risk of significant bleed. However, some patients would need management for fluid overload when they are getting into the recovery phase, that's a tricky time because uh, whatever fluids out in the interstitium would start getting resolved. And if there is excessive uh, resorption or happening over a short period of time, uh, it's likely to precipitate congestive heart failure. So one has to watch carefully and in a subset, one may have to use diuretics. Uh, in, in, a, in a small proportion, one may get uh, renal dysfunction wherein one would have to rely on renal replacement therapies. In addition, in children who have been in hospitals, they would always be concerned about secondary infections. So meticulous adherence to infection control practices has to be done. Now, this is just one of the strategies where people talk about targeted interventions, multiple things like restrictive resuscitation, uh, trying to use colloids uh, for severe shock, uh, monitoring for fluid overload and intra-abdominal hypertension. Uh, early respiratory supports in some form, maybe it may be uh, like an IV non-invasive ventilation to begin with, uh, prevention and management of major bleeds. And those who have uh, major hemorrhage, one would try and look at uh, uh, the preventing the complications. And therein, if the, if the child's getting into trouble because of excessive uh, fluid within the intravascular compartment, uh, try to remove the, the fluid by either diuresis or uh, peritoneal dialysis. And here one may also have to, in a subset, consider options of uh, continuous renal replacement therapy or uh, SLED uh, as dialysis, which should be done slowly over a period of time. Now, these are not really been tested in uh, a trial setting, and people have just reported on uh, observed as a case series. And uh, But I think the main takeaway would be that uh, one would have to think beyond the usual fluids, monitoring, and at the same time manage this as a sick child who uh, would be admitted in the ICU and thinking beyond the fluids. Uh, hemorrhagic manifestations, so mild bleeds and all hemodynamically stable. Mostly we don't need any uh, uh, platelet infusions, uh, essentially supportive care, avoiding injections and monitoring. Uh, in a subset, if we need to insert an NG tube for feeds and all, we need to do it with great care so as to avoid mucosal trauma, which may then bleed. Uh, uh, difficult to have cutoffs uh, for transfusion, but uh, many units would uh, infuse platelets if the counts are less than 10,000 without any bleeding, or uh, if the child has significant bleeding, then uh, counts of uh, 40 000 to 50,000 may be the cutoff. For severe bleeding with hemodynamic stability, excessive mucosal bleed, uh, one would consider blood transfusion with monitoring. However, there is uh, little evidence to support transfusing platelets and or FFP for severe bleeding. And when this cannot be managed uh, with uh, just uh, fresh whole blood or fresh fat cells, uh, one would consider FFP and uh, uh, the, the frozen plasma and uh, platelet concentrates. Uh, there have been some uh, other options which people have evaluated, right? Recombinant factor 7A, uh, which may be beneficial in those who have severe bleeding. Uh, the intravenous entity globulin, there may be some benefit for improving platelet counts in uh, dengue. However, there seems to be insufficient evidence for IVIG and uh, let's say Tenexa for controlling the bleeding. Monitoring is the key and uh, the WHO documents do suggest uh, using, uh, uh, let's say, a simple, this uh, mnemonic kind of thing, five in one magic touch, trying to look for color of extremities, capillary fill time, temperature, pulse volume and pulse rate and BP every 15 to 20 minutes still out of shock and thereafter one to two early. So I think apart from the uh, lab man lab monitoring, clinical monitoring is, is, is critical. However, severe patients, uh, severe dengue pa patients should be admitted to a high dependency unit or preferably to pediatric intensive care unit. And therein one may do more intensive monitoring or continuous ECG, pulse oximetry, uh, where possible, uh, particularly those with shock, we should try and get an arterial line and monitor the arterial blood pressure using 
uh, uh, transducer. If not possible, then one would have to rely on uh, NIDP. Uh, one would have to still do multimodal monitoring, looking for the respiratory state, input output charting, uh, uh, other measures which would assist our IVC measurement to give an idea about whether the child is likely to be fluid responsive or not. Uh, looking at uh, ultrasound of the chest for pleural effusions, markers of fluid overload, hematocrit uh, monitored frequently. And again, as in a critically ill child, one may be needing to do blood uh, electrolytes and blood gases every 12 hours. Uh, various tests for organ dysfunction as in been indicated. And if a child is not improving, one does have to look for cardiac dysfunction and echocardiography would be required. Uh, look for anemia and acidosis and treat accordingly. So I'll just quickly uh, uh, run over a couple of cases that we saw recently. Uh, uh, one of these is still admitted with us. So this is a two-year-old kid uh, brought to the emergency with complaints of fever for five days, cough for four days, and difficult breathing for two days. Uh, in the uh, ER, the child had low saturation. Uh, the respiratory rates were quite high, 72 per minute with increased distress, bilateral creps and auscultation. Uh, marked tachycardia, capillary refill was less than three, blood pressure seemed to be fine and was febrile. Uh, the child had uh, uh, diffuse uh, opacities on the lung fields uh, on the chest X-ray, uh, was COVID negative. The, the blood counts uh, suggested a normal range with uh, neutrophil dominance, platelets again borderline, and uh, the, P, the uh, some suggestion towards some metabolic acidosis and lacked it uh, within a normal range. However, over a period of time, the distress kind of worsened, initially managed with high flow, but had to be intubated because this was persisting. Uh, with that possibility of pneumonia and all antimicrobials were added. A uh, child was subsequently uh, had uh, uh, shock and had to, apart from fluids, had to be started on norepinephrine and uh, epinephrine. Amongst the investigations, even though the presentation was more respiratory, uh, dengue NS1 was uh, positive and subsequently IgM was positive and test X-ray showed ARDS. Uh, on echocardiography, there was uh, moderate left ventricular dysfunction, uh, elevated uh, uh, the natriuretic peptide. Add uh, pancytopenia subsequently, low hemoglobin, platelets drop into 85,000. And again, uh, some suggestion about uh, budding uh, yeast on uh, blood fungal culture sample. Over a period of time, child actually worsened and uh, had abdominal distension, transferred to PICU. On investigation, was found to have perforation peritonitis and uh, had to undergo an exploratory lab, which was suggestive of a duodenal perforation and which was uh, repaired and peritoneal toileting was done. The shock is what persisted. Thereafter, uh, the child had uh, to be managed and also had to be given albumin infusion because of low albumin. Uh, respiratory worsening, ARDS, uh, which was continuing, uh, antibiotics were modified. Uh, and thereafter, subsequently, the child had fluid overload, uh, had to be given furosemide infusion. And once the child seemed to be out of getting better, but we found it difficult to wean off and the child had poor sensorium. So uh, underwent a tracheostomy, weaned off to O2 by TPs and subsequently to room air. Now, these were the X-rays which show bilateral diffuse infiltrates on uh, let's say two uh, uh, days uh, separated by about a couple of weeks. Uh, as you can see, it has tubes, has a uh, uh, central venous line, uh, PCG leads and all for the monitoring. And here is the MRI that we had done, uh, which kind of suggested multiple small uh, bleeds, which are there seen almost all over the brain parenchyma. Uh, and that possibly is the reason. Now, there's no large collection as such, so it may be part of the uh, uh, in, uh, related to the dengue infection per se, rather than being due to thrombocytopenia. So this child is recovering and we have this uh, unusual manifestation. So beyond what we talked about, fever, abdominal pain, vomiting, uh, shock, uh, bleeding manifestations, a whole lot of other atypical or unusual clinical features have been identified, which kind of come into expanded dengue syndrome. So they could be cardiac, so bad arrhythmias, tech arrhythmias, myocarditis, pericarditis, uh, acute liver failure amongst the GI and hepatic manifestations, pancreatitis, uh, an abdominal compartment syndrome, acute kidney injury, uh, acute respiratory distress syndrome, uh, manifestations like pneumonitis, bronchiolitis, and pulmonary hemorrhage. And pulmonary hemorrhage actually could be devastating. Uh, very often, uh, that is a preterminal uh, event. 
And the hematological manifestations, one may have uh, the plastic anemia or thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura. Uh, the neurological manifestations are increasingly being reported. So one would be during the course of acute illness like dengue encephalopathy, and in some scenarios, it could be encephalitis, intracranial bleeds, uh, events that could happen after dengue infection, which are immune-mediated like transverse myelitis or uh, acute disseminated encephalomyelitis, bullion barre syndrome, or abnormalysis, and there would be a small number of kids who have neuroophthalmologic manifestations. So this kind of syndrome refers to dengue cases with multiple organ involvement like cardiovascular, gastrointestinal, renal, respiratory, and hematological. Uh, we don't really have uh, data to say how common is it, but again, the series from uh, uh, Puducherry in South India reported on nearly 250 children of whom about uh, uh, more than third had severe disease. And here we can see a varied numbers like seizures been there in about 7%, encephalopathy in 3%, hepatitis has been more common and been there in about 11%, uh, ARDS in about 2%. Uh, hemophagocytic syndrome again reported in a uh, couple of uh, children. So this would be an area where maybe uh, a systematic review, otherwise one would have to really look at because most of these conditions are, are uh, published in literature as case reports and maybe small case series. Quickly on to another case description, an eight-year-old pre-morbidly normal child fever, altered sensorium, total duration six days, altered sensorium two days, uh, episode of abnormal movement two days prior to presentation. Also had history of hematemesis, uh, abdominal pain, melina, petechial rash, and decreased urine output before when he presented to the ER. Uh, he was admitted in a, in a hospital, sensorium worsened, and uh, uh, subsequently had an episode of seizure. And amongst the labs which were done, there was thrombocytopenia, bilirubin slightly elevated, marked increase in the enzymes, the uh, AST and ALT, uh, features of acute kidney injury like uh, raised uh, urea of 61 milligram per DL and creatinine of 1.6. And again, had a dengue NS1 and also sensitivity. So this child uh, had to be intubated because of poor uh, sensorium and poor respiratory efforts. Uh, had received a, a combination because the diagnosis initially was not clear and received both antibacterials as well as uh, uh, for scrub. And uh, for his ICP, uh, uh, he started on hypertonic saline and uh, phenytoin for the seizure. Uh, the initial imaging of the brain, uh, plane scan was normal. And there were these multiple differentials before we had that uh, NS1 report positivity like severe dengue, rickets cell or leptospirosis, uh, hepatic encephalopathy, which could be due to hepatotopic viruses, intracranial bleed and significant cerebral edema were ruled out uh, uh, by doing a scan. Now, subsequently, the child uh, continued to be ventilated, uh, had issues with the consolidation in the, in the lungs, uh, minimal effusion. And thereafter, it appeared that the child has had bicytopenia, non-oliguric ARI, acute liver failure, GI bleed, um, a highly elevated ferritin value, which kind of uh, made it appear like hyperferritinemic sepsis. Marked uh, uh, increase in the transaminases to more than uh, 13,000 for the AST and uh, ALT of uh, 4,400. Uh, subsequently, the child had intraretinal bleeds, uh, had to be reintubated, and when it was done, there was profuse ET bleeds with clots. Uh, marked increase in the work of breathing, asynchrony, difficult to ventilate, and the child had to be ventilated with a uh, uh, high frequency oscillator. So this is another spectrum that we would tend to see more commonly, which is the hemophagocytic lymphohistiocytosis, which is a potentially fatal complication. Uh, it's a hyperinflammatory state due to uncontrolled proliferation of activated lymphocytes and uh, uh, surplus of pro-inflammatory cytokines. Uh, we would suspect when there is persistent fever, thrombocytopenia persisting beyond 10 days, and hyperferritinemia and elevated lactate level, and Amongst the series of HLH, secondary HLH, which have been reported from tropical uh, countries, uh, dengue is an important cause. In one of these series from Chandigarh, uh, uh, it was nearly 17% were contributed or attributed to dengue. Uh, the management is uh, supportive. Uh, what could help are intravenous immunoglobulins and also corticosteroids. 
Uh, however, one has to be careful that uh, there's no secondary infection which is associated, and if it's there, uh, one would uh, need to treat it adequately. Uh, it's associated with higher incidence of liver dysfunction and ARDS, increased requirement for invasive ventilation, longer duration of ICU stay. Uh, a recent study kind of suggested that the soluble interleukin-2 receptor levels may be a biomarker in Ketra dengue for HLH. Other important thing that uh, we would be interested in is, uh, or, or people would want to know is whether we can predict progression to uh, severe disease. Uh, even though this is desirable, so far it's been challenging. Uh, I think many countries have been able to improve outcomes in these kids by simply monitoring and identifying the sick children or those who have signs of with warning signs and admitting and managing them with adequate fluids and uh, majority of these children would recover. So children who have lethargy, persistent vomiting, abdominal pain, diarrhea. So a lot of these are markers for or, or are warning signs. And in that setting, one would have to be looking at possibility of severe disease. Uh, various biomarkers people have been trying to look at, uh, including uh, matrix metalloproteinases, uh, interleukin-10, uh, SVCAM1, and IP10. But we really don't have a good model where we could do a test on day one and say that, okay, this child is likely to be developing uh, severe disease, and therefore we need to monitor more carefully or uh, preemptively uh, hospitalize these children. Uh, with the COVID, uh, it, it did bring in another challenge uh, was that there were uh, co-infections and uh, uh, their data mainly from adults, which suggested that these uh, people have uh, likely to have more severe disease, high rate of ICU admission and greater mortality. Uh, some suggestion towards similar pathophysiology, which is like cytokine storm, uh, capillary leakage, thrombocytopenia and coagulopathy. Also, uh, there may be times when one may, may confuse or may have to keep possibility of multisystem inflammatory syndrome uh, associated with COVID as a differential diagnosis. So hypothesis being as a co-infection, there could be some synergism or individually these could cause multiple organ damage. Uh, as clinicians, I think uh, we do feel the lack of anti-dengue drugs uh, uh, we are, uh, and there are no specific drugs available, even though multiple drugs have been investigated. Uh, in literature, various uh, targets uh, relate to various dengue viral protein, including E protein, uh, various uh, NS proteins, and NS5 methyltransferase and RNA polymerase. Uh, there have been multiple studies on various herbal products or extracts and so on. However, we really don't have robust trials which may be uh, indicating that a particular product would be helpful. Uh, also, the, the catch is that uh, antiviral drugs are, are going to be useful only in the early phase. A lot of pathogenesis of severe disease happens when uh, there may not be any circulating virus. So that in itself brings challenges as to how these drugs are going to be evaluated or positioned and, and uh, uh, subsequently if efficacy is proven. Uh, the overall outcomes, if you look at a large scale uh, with appropriate management, the case fatality rates would be less than 1%. However, when we talk about severe dengue, mortality rate may be as high as 20%. And uh, the common causes of death include refractory shock, multiple organ dysfunction, and in a subset, there may be uh, a massive bleed, which may be responsible. And particularly if it's pulmonary hemorrhage, it's often a pre-terminal uh, event. Uh, we do need research uh, for prediction of uh, severe disease, uh, uh, mechanism of thrombocytopenia and bleeds, uh, cytokine storm as to which children should be monitored and whether there could be a panel which could suggest uh, and which would have implication on the management, a need for anti-dengue drugs. And subsequently, I think uh, one would definitely look at identification of vaccine candidates. Of, uh, the only licensed vaccine is not used widely and uh, there have been a couple of uh, vaccine candidates uh, where phase three trials have been done, but I think it still has to reach a stage where it can be recommended. Uh, uh, so within last uh, over last few years, we, our group has been involved in this multidisciplinary research, trying to understand the uh, pathogenesis or trying to indicate severity or pick up markers uh, to help understand the disease pathophysiology uh, uh, better. Uh, so to sum up, uh, uh, dengue is a global problem and uh, children, including infants, are at risk of severe disease, while majority would be doing fine. But 
Uh, I think uh, there's a subset where so what have severe disease and management of these needs typical tertiary care, uh, just like any other critically ill child. Uh, the challenges in diagnosis, I think it's more to do with uh, similar manifestations as other tropical infections and overlap of the time period when these infections happen. Uh, availability of point of care test definitely has eased out uh, the uh, ease or has eased out the diagnosis part. Uh, tertiary care typically there would be a skew towards uh, severe disease, and uh, uh, there's also a possibility that uh, in, in resource limited settings. A lot of children may actually present late. So even though they may have a manageable disease to begin with, the delay in itself, shock persisting for a few hours, initiates a cascade uh, which progresses very rapidly. And I think increasingly we are seeing more uh, atypical manifestations, organ involvements, and therefore we need to be watching carefully and managing these with uh, intensive care. Uh, the management protocols are standardized, and I think they do well for uh, uh, the overwhelming majority, but a subset of kids who get more severe disease, organ dysfunctions, should be managed in intensive care units uh, uh, with the attempt to support the organ function. Uh, there are gray areas in the management of atypical manifestations, particularly neurological, but uh, I think uh, if these, are, these continue to occur, I'm sure there would be some more data which may guide or make the therapy evidence-based. And definitely, I think uh, research needed to identify anti-dengue drugs and more targeted therapies or personalized medicine kind of approaches is what would be the need of the hour. So thank you. Thank you for your patient uh, listening and over to you, Dr. Nelika. Uh, th thank you, Dr. Roda, for that uh, excellent presentation. We will be taking questions at the end. There are a lot of questions in the chat. Uh, and please, uh, if, if anybody has any questions or comments uh, about uh, Dr. Lodak's presentation, please uh, put in your comments in the chat box. So we'll move on to Dr. Anandavi Vijay Vikrama. And he, uh, I, I am most happy, uh, I'm most happy to uh, introduce him. He is the senior most clinician uh, for dengue management in uh, Sri Lanka. He is from the National Institute of Infectious Diseases and heads the uh, Dengue Clinical Management uh, Unit in Sri Lanka. He's instrumental in uh, uh, the editing and uh, taking care of the uh, Dengue Clinical Management Guidelines in Sri Lanka, uh, both for adults, children, and uh, in pregnancy. Uh, he's the past president of the uh, Ceylon College of Physicians and the president-elect of the Sri Lanka Medical Association. He has had numerous publications uh, uh, and, and the done orations and uh, spoken at international forums. Uh, so without the further uh, going on about Dr. Anand Vijay Vikrama, I invite him to talk about dengue in pregnancy, complications and clinical dilemmas. Uh, over to you, uh, Dr. Vijay Vikrama. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Nilika, for that uh, kind introduction. And uh, I would uh, like to thank the organizing committee for giving me this opportunity to share some of the experience in this subject, which of course uh, a bit probably con con uh, controversial. Um, now, uh, uh, I would like to briefly uh, discuss these things uh, in my presentation, the gravity of the problem that is the pregnant, dengue in pregnancy, the complications in dengue in pregnancy, physiology of pregnancy complicating the picture, clinical dilemmas and when to intervene. For example, uh, how low is low urine output, how narrow is narrow pulse pressure and so on. And the clinical dilemmas, the, the, uh, the biggest issues are when to deliver. Uh, to start with uh, where the Loda stopped, uh, the dengue being a global problem, you can see how rapidly dengue had been rising globally from 1950s to 19, uh, early 2000. And uh, by now, according to WHO estimates, uh, 100 to 400 million infections occur each year and 80% of mild and asymptomatic, which means 20% of these infections are uh, moderate or severe infections in dengue, including DHF and DSS. Uh, in 2020, many countries, including uh, my country, Sri Lanka, uh, reported increasing number of cases, and especially uh, the, the South Asia and uh, South American countries, many countries reported increasing numbers of this. Uh, in uh, 
Sri Lanka, we saw this with this increasing number of cases. There's a change of age distribution. Uh, this is an article by our uh, moderator, Professor Malavike, uh, about the changes in the age distribution of dengue in Sri Lanka. And earlier, when uh, we started having outbreaks in 19, late 1980s, it was a pediatric illness. And uh, But then, since uh, at that time, in 2000, about 60% of cases were less than 19 years of age, but this number had been gradually declining with increasing number of cases reported in uh, higher age groups. And by 2012, uh, about we have seen about an 18-fold rise in the age group of uh, 20 to 40 years of age. This is how the age groups change in Sri Lanka. Uh, in 1996, more than 75% of cases are less than 15 years of age, and the age groups change in 2002 across each other. The blue line is for the more than 15 years of age, and in 2012, less than 50, less than 25% were in the age cat group category of less than 15 years of age, and more than 50, 75% were above 15 years of age. And of this. 50% of cases uh, between 15 to 45 years of age, which means the reprodu reproductive age, which necessarily putting pregnant mothers and reproductive age group females at risk of getting dengue. So I started seeing more and more dengue in pregnant mothers. And this age group change had been noted in other countries too. This is uh, a report from India, uh, which says, uh, this age shift has been reported in Singapore, Indonesia, Bangladesh, and Thailand. Old age groups are significantly affected in the last major outbreak in Delhi, India. So we see these pregnant mothers, and this is a patient I came across uh, about three years ago. I was asked to see this patient in, uh, in a private hospital. Patient had been admitted to the hospital uh, on 2nd of June with fever for two days. And then patient has started the plasma leakage going into DHF. And I was asked to see the patient on 5th of June afternoon. And at that time, the patient was in shock with tachypnea, tachycardia, and patient had bilateral pleural effusion and ascites. Uh, patient was overloaded uh, towards the latter part of the critical phase. So I treated her with, uh, admitted to the ICU, treated her with the dextran bolus. We, we give dextran to uh, patients who are overloaded. That is the first preference uh, rather than albumin. And uh, then we had small dose of furosemide. And with that, she became stable. And after that, we re gradually reduced the fluid. Her PCV was stable overnight and blood pressure had been stable. And uh, she had passed a good uh, amount of urine. At six o'clock in the morning, I got a call from the ICU saying the obstetricians want to do a cesarean section as the fetal movements are less and the CTG shows fetal distress. Now this patient is in the latter part of critical phase. Plated count is 30,000. What should be my answer? I was in a dilemma. To answer this, we had to look at the possible complications which occur in dengue. Many complications have been reported and naturally the first, uh, uh, first uh, focus would be on the pregnancy outcome. The, the outcome to the, the baby. Uh, this is a systemic review of 30 published articles which showed that uh, there's a risk of vertical transmission. However, the risk of adverse pregnancy outcome was inconclusive according to this article. There was a tendency for low birth, uh, uh, premature births and low birth rates, but th th those were not statistically significant. This is another such uh, meta-analysis and the systemic review, uh, where six, 16 studies were evaluated, where the, which showed there's a uh, odds ratio of 3.5 for miscarriages and, uh, and the uh, relative risk of 6.7 uh, for stillbirths. However, they concluded that uh, the odds ratio associated with dengue was 1.7 for preterm birth, and for low birth, it was 
Then this study shows not only the, the pregnancy outcome, but the maternal outcome too. Again, uh, uh, meta-analysis of 36 studies, which showed pregnancy was associated with an increased risk of maternal mortality with an odds ratio of 4.14 and stillbirths again with a high odds ratio and neonatal deaths and which was compared with non-pregnant women. However, there was no, this was statistically not significant though there was a significant, uh, there was a higher ratio uh, in among maternal patients. This is from the, that study, which shows you can see the preterm births, the, how the odds ratio change, and the maternal mortality. Many studies included in this uh, meta-analysis has shown odds ratio of more than one, uh, and the, the, the cumulative odds ratio was 4.1 in this analysis. And the reason for this increased maternal mortality is evident from their analysis. There was a significant uh, proportion whole prevalence of DHF or dengue, rather dengue shock syndrome was 14.9%, which is quite high compared to uh, non-pregnant population, non-pregnant adult population. And of course, the maternal bleeding, again, with the, with the odds ratio of 2.79. And these are the reasons which led to, in, obviously led to increased uh, maternal mortality. This uh, study from Brazil showed again, showed there was a uh, having severe dengue among pregnant women was highly significant and uh, further analysis showed uh, pregnant women were 3.4 times more prone to develop severe dengue with an odds ratio of 3.38. So it was with this we have to answer this question. There are case series again, this is from Port Sudan where they analyzed the 70, analyzed 70 outcome of 78 pregnant mothers and where there had been 21.7% deaths. And uh, this is another small study from India, where 25 patients, uh, pregnant mothers analyzed who had dengue, where again, uh, three patients died with the mortality rate of 12%. So obviously it has a quite a high mortality rate. So why is this difference, these differences in dengue? which has a higher morbidity, higher rate of severe dengue, that is uh, dengue hemorrhagic fever and dengue shock syndrome, and with a higher mortality. And in our experience, we see these patients tend to leak much earlier than non-pregnant uh, patients also. And that also probably is another reason for these complications. So why is these issues? For some, of course, we don't know the answers, but then we know there are changes in the physiology in pregnancy which affects hemodynamics, hematology, biochemistry, and monitoring. Therefore, monitoring of pregnant mothers. Uh, we know the monitoring is very important in dengue to detect problems early so that we can address uh, those problems. If you look at hematological changes, we know the blood volume increases by about 40 to 50%, and the plasma volume increases by 50%, uh, and the uh, red cell mass increases, However, the plasma volume increases, increases much higher than the red cell mass increase. Therefore, there's a hemodilution, which leads to a fall in hematocrit, which is one of the main things we are monitoring in, in dengue. And then uh, the leukocyte uh, function de is depressed, making them more vulnerable to infections. And of course, the platelet count can be low in these patients to begin with. In the respiratory system, this creates a hyperventilation state with the uh, with a state of respiratory alkalosis. And then in cardiovascular system, there are a lot of changes with uh, including increase in heart rate and stroke volume, and uh, the cardiac output increases markedly by the end of first trimester, and therefore pul the pulmonary blood flow increases. So the implication would be in fluid overload, these patients can go easily go into pulmonary edema. And blood pressure changes are also very marked in pregnant mothers during mid trimester. Changes in blood pressure may cause uh, fainting in some patients. In latter pregnancy, hypertension may occur in 10% of people. And blood pressure may fall by 15, 10 to 15% from their original blood pressure. And then urine output, which is another key parameter which we monitor in dengue patients, is also altered in pregnancy because of their increased renal blood flow and increased uh, GFR which is increased by about 50%. So all these changes, and of course the liver functions are depressed and liver enzymes are elevated. 
So with all these problems, with uh, occurring with normal physiological changes in pregnancy, which tend to affect monitoring parameters in dengue, we have uh, many, many issues. These changes tend to cause increased intravascular volume, vasodilatation, increased renal perfusion, metrological changes. And then we do quite frequently the ultrasound examination of the abdomen and just to detect the plasma leakage, but it is evident, it is obvious that in pregnant mothers, it is difficult to detect due to, especially in advanced pregnancy, due to the gravid uterus. So we have tachycardia in these patients, wide pulse pressure, low systolic blood pressure, tachypnea, increased urine output, low hemoglobin and PCV, thrombocytopenia, difficulty detecting leaking clinically as well as ultrasonically. And it is with all these things that we have to manage these patients. So therefore, there are many recommendations made in the management of uh, dengue patients. Uh, we have our own guideline, which is made with the, of course, with the consensus, with the, uh, after a lot of discussions with obstetricians, physicians, and hematologists, and so on. Uh, and, uh, and then the WHO guideline also gives certain recommendations. Uh, so all this says uh, to, it is better to, it is important to admit these patients early and monitor these patients because complications are much more common than in non-pregnant uh, population. So their initial white count may not be low in contrast to other non-pregnant patients. Therefore, we have to look for the trend of these things. Therefore, you, you can easily be misguided thinking that it's not dengue. And then we need to start these patients monitoring closely for doing regular repeated PC hematopoietic measurements, PCV measurements. We recommend it to do once the platelet count goes below 150,000. Whereas generally in non-pregnant patients, they start plasma leaking when the platelet count goes below 100,000. So in infected mothers, it can, as I said earlier, it can occur early. And uh, in others, serum albumin and cholesterol can be useful, but uh, in uh, pregnant mothers, it's not so. And when you measure blood pressure, you need to measure it in the left lateral position so that the venous return is not impaired due to the gravid uterus. And then um, some important consensus we arrived at when we were writing guidelines was to adopt a different threshold for intervention for urine output, which Otherwise, we take the 0.5 ml per hour per, per kg per hour as the, as the, the limit. Uh, but for pregnant mothers, because of uh, their increased renal blood flow, the consensus was to have a higher urine output that is 0.75 ml per hour and a heart rate of 100 and a respiratory rate of more than 25, whereas in a, otherwise uh, uh, other non pregnant mothers, it's less than 20. And for the to determine a patient is in shock, we, the consensus was to have a figure of 25 rather than 20, which is the figure we use for non-pregnant patients. The reason being these uh, pregnant mothers are having wide pulse pressure. Of course, these are uh, figures arrived at with consensus. Of course, we don't have evidence on this, but uh, the, the physiological changes uh, were used as the rationale to arrive at these, uh, these uh, changes or, or limitations of these parameters. And then if they are, if, since they bleed after delivery, normally also there is a raw surface. So one has to have a low threshold to give blood transfusions. Generally, we don't recommend to give platelet transfusion however much the platelet is low in non-pregnant or pregnant mothers for that matter. But in case if they are to have a cesarean section, we need to increase the platelet count by increasing uh, by platelet transfusions by increasing it to 50,000 and for a normal vaginal delivery uh, for 30,000. These are the recommendations, not for, we, we are using it for dengue also, but these are the recommendations for thrombocytopenic patients for other reasons made by uh, other uh, obstetric uh, colleges. However, you have to be cautious of overloading when you uh, transfuse platelets. And then delivering of dengue is, is another, this uh, probably the biggest dilemma. We had a lot of discussions in this and finally we came to these recommendations. In early illness, if one has to deliver the baby, probably it will have less problems. So if it is essential for some reason, you leave it early in the illness, 
for say a 40 week uh, mother uh, comes with dengue or with day one with some other obstetric complications maybe you can deliver that uh, uh, patient before the patient progresses uh, in dengue illness but still you have to look for bleeding monitor hematoc pcb regularly and if drops you have to think have a late threshold to low threshold to give blood transfusions and we recommend not to induce these patients and allow the normal process to continue because if the if the delivery can be delayed beyond the uh, period of dengue so much the better and in case it if the patient is going into normal labor if we can avoid the critical phase or if you can delay the labor until the critical phase is over at least that is something which one has to try because the complications and especially bleeding is likely to be much higher if uh, uh, the delivery is done during the critical phase and therefore if the labor pains occurs during the critical phase we recommend to try to delay the labor by using tocolytics like nifedipine or atosibian and uh, in fact we have tried this and, and it is useful it is working and useful and even after critical phase is over the tendency to bleed is there for the next three four days therefore monitoring parameters and pcv and the transuse if the patient becomes unstable have a low threshold to transuse if the patient becomes unstable so surgery in uh, dengue uh, with in pregnant dengue we say avoid surgery unless to save the mother's life forget the baby fetal distress in dengue mother is not an indication for cesarean section in case if the surgery is done to save the mother in unavoidable circumstances try and do it early in the illness which may have less risk however still as i said earlier bleeding can occur therefore we need to monitor vitals and pcv regularly and transfuse if the patient is unstable if doing cesarean section for some reason replace the blood loss with blood and uh, then of course baby should be monitored uh, as vertical transmission is possible and of course you have to be keep in you have to keep in mind about the mimics uh, many other illnesses can have similar issues like sepsis especially the help syndrome we are hemo hemolysis elevated liver enzymes low platelet and toxemia where the blood picture retic count and the differences in liver enzymes would be helpful to differentiate the illness so now we come back to our pregnant mother so in the morning when i got this call i thought of uh, i was thinking of uh, pros and cons of this and then i had a discussion with the obstetricians and we together decided to postpone the delivery and we explained the risk to the mother to relatives and we told them that it's the mother's life which comes first it's a young mother uh, 25 years and uh, so the the chances of complications are much higher than a normal cesarean section in a, a cesarean section of a non dengue patient or non dengue for that matter non dengue mother so we kept the patient we didn't go ahead with the caesar the relatives of the also agreed so everybody decided not to go ahead with the caesar then later the patient started to get some hypoglycemic attacks which was treated with the dextrose infusion then after that she became stable and then her the platelet count started going up from 26, 22, and then 43, and went to 55. Hematopoietic remained stable. And the, the issue of uh, delivery came on 6th of June. Then she became stable. Platelet counts went up. And then on 10th of June, we did an elective seizure, and an unexpected baby was delivered through a cesarean section. And mother did not have any complication. So I think here, the weight was well birth. This is another baby who delivered in our ICU to the dengue mother. So thank you very much for your patient listening. And I'll be we'll be happy to discuss this. I'm sure there will be many questions on this controversial thing because uh, uh, we don't have much evidence on this. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Anandi Vijay Vikrama, for that very excellent presentation. Uh, so now I, I will uh, take questions. Uh, but uh, first, I'll start uh, taking questions with, uh, which have come in the chat. And if anybody uh, has a question, uh, you can uh, raise your hand. 
and and or put it in the chat box. So uh, first, uh, there are questions for uh, uh, Dr. Loda. Okay, so it's about uh, using of the colloids. So uh, uh, whether uh, albumin is used uh, because uh, some countries uh, use dextran 40. And uh, so uh, there's Dr. Anand Vijayvikram also. So albumin versus dextran 40. Uh, what are your views, uh, Dr. Loda? So I think, uh, as I said, I guess um, our mainstay still would be crystalloids. So it's, uh, I think I'd like to put across the point that we routinely do not use colloids. And it's only a very, very small subset where one, maybe if one has to use a colloid, uh, our preferences for albumin. Uh, now, Dextran in general, the availability and over a period of time, there have been concerns about some of the toxicity. So 